So if you guys have been sticking through this video series about folds with me, you know that two weeks ago we went over pipe folds. Last week we did zigzag folds. So today we are on spiral folds. So we are back at it with folds again, and as you can see, we are dealing with the spiral fold today, right? So if you guys remember my first video where I mentioned that there's going to be some similarities between these folds. So if you guys have seen the past two videos, you're probably thinking this looks a lot like the zigzag fold we just went over last week. Well, it does. It does have some similarities to the zigzag fold. But there is a key difference here in terms of how much fabric is gathering and also what the fabric is doing in there. So looking back at this image that we looked at in the previous video, you can see there's a diagram right here where the fabric is actually twisting with some tension, right? The fabric is being twisted around. You can see by the arrows pointing this way and this way. And that's a little more about what's happening with the spiral fold. Um, but with the spiral, it's twisting to some degree, it doesn't need to be an extreme deg degree, but it's also being pressed together. So fabric is kind of gathering. So here, here you can see the fabric is nice and tight. The, the length of the fabric is not being compressed in any way. Here you have that accordion effect that we talked about um, with the Ziploc fold. So this is what's kind of giving us a little more of a spiral fold. Whereas when we're looking at the zigzag fold, what you're thinking about is more of like folds that have kind of been worn in to close a little bit. So it doesn't need necessarily need to be compressed to create that zigzag fold. And you kind of see where we're getting that zigzag look over here and how we're getting something that looks a little different over here in this example, where we're getting a little more of close knitted spirals of more fabric kind of closely folded together. So going back to this example, and before I go any further, if you guys are interested, I've mentioned this before, but this uh, diagram is out of a book called Drawing People, How to Portray the Clothed Figure by Barbara Bradley. Um, again, she has nothing to do with my videos here, but it's just if you do need an example of where to get these diagrams from, and I don't want to be stealing any content, so I do want to give the credit where it's due. We can see here we have a couple examples, and this is what I drew from when I was looking for photos today too. We have a curtain rod with the, the fabric of the curtain kind of gathered together nice and tight. And then just a kind of example of, you know, we're looking at sweater sleeves again, but also just kind of what happens when fabric is compressed and also it's slightly twisted onto a cylinder, which is the same thing of what we can consider an arm underneath fabric, right? Because we don't see that person's arm. So we're really just thinking of it as some sort of loose cylinder shape. So sometimes it just makes sense when we're just looking at these diagrams, I know. But just a couple things to keep in mind before we jump to our references and then we start drawing this together. When we do have an arm that is wearing the fabric, you're going to have what is called like these tension lines where you can see the lines are kind of communicating between the armpit area and the other point of tension, which is the elbow, because the fabric is coming around here. And even though it's an abundance of fabric, it is being stretched around the elbow creating tension between these two points. Lastly, the thing we want to consider, the thing that makes this mostly different from the zigzag fold is how closely knit all these little folds are going to be next to each other. Now, we, when we go into this, some of this will be a little detailed, some won't. I'll try my best to do kind of an in-between of really highly detailed and not. But you can see that these folds are really, really close together because of how the fabric is kind of being compressed into itself, right? So we don't really get big, open, chunky eye looks like we did when we were looking at the zigzag, but instead we get kind of these really small, compressed folds that come together nice and tight. All right, so taking a look at some photos here of what we're expecting when we're looking for these spiral folds, I just kind of went with what was shown in the example that Barbara was giving us in the book. So here we have a curtain on a curtain rod, right? <clears throat> and now this is really light, so I know it's kind of hard to see, but you can really see these close-knit um, folds and gaps here just kind of all spiraling in together, 
just like so, kind of creating a really scrunched together look. So this is what we're looking for when it comes to spiral folds. So on the left here, we have an example of the same thing, curtain rod, you got the curtain on there, not as scrunched together and as the white example over here to the right, but you can see we still have these nice close together knits um, and that are creating these really nice tension folds coming through here as well. So since this is easier to see, we are going to use the example on the left for our first practice here. I do just kind of want to mention while I have both these pictures up here that you can see that the gray material is a heavier kind of canvas material versus the light linen kind of material to the right. So again, we do want to be thinking um, what kind of fabric we are drawing or using on our characters or on our objects, whatever we're drawing. It does affect it, right? Light linen compresses and creates all these really nice intricate folds. The heavier material over here, it compresses, but we're not getting as dramatic of folds. Things to think about. All right, so in this one, we are drawing an object. So we would want to have our underneath the fabric object. So, you know, it's a pole here because it's on a curtain rod. So just go ahead and give yourself a quick indication of the curtain rod. You don't have to draw the ball on the end. I was just doing that to kind of show where I'm starting in this drawing. I'm not going to be drawing all the way across here either. Um, you know, it's a lot of detail. So I just kind of wanted to draw in a snippet here. So one thing I do whether this is fabric on a human or a, a curtain rod or whatever the object is that we're drawing and I'm trying to draw a spiral fold at least, is I like to start with the bumps that are created by the compression of the fabric. This is kind of just like, you know, like I like to call my connect the dots method. So this way I, I kind of have an indication when I go further into knowing where the folds are gonna be generated already. And this kind of gives me a good idea of how I want my picture to look. I don't necessarily need to capture every single bump in my reference image. And I think that's important to realize that we do want to know how we can break this down into something that's a little more simple so that we can replicate this when we're drawing this on our own from our imagination. <clears throat> so it's important to follow your reference. But it's also important to know when you can kind of break it down and change it for your own uses. So you can see here, I found kind of like a rough indication of that ridge inside the red box there on the cheat sheet. And now I'm just gonna create some of these spiral folds, these little pockets where the cloth folds in and it's giving us that nice shadow shape. So you wanna remember when you're drawing folds, the reason we're seeing folds is because they have creased in you know, towards the cylinder or whatever's inside, right? They've creased inwards, and that means they're capturing less light. Light is hitting them less than it is hitting the outward creases or the outward folds. So these are just pockets of shadow. Um, you can draw them linear like I'm drawing, <clears throat> but sometimes drawing it just like a small indication of tone, like you saw in the examples in the beginning, can kind of amplify your drawing to the next level a little bit. So it's always a good way to practice as well. So here we don't really have too much tension. In some of our other drawings, we're gonna see there's tension between um, what's going on underneath, where the joints are bending and all that stuff because we're gonna be looking at clothes on humans. But here we just kind of have a straight pull and all the tension is really just being pulled down. So the, the curves of these folds are going kind of either way here. Really, you just wanna get an indication of these creases going in. Don't draw every little tiny crease if you can get away with it. Sometimes less is more, especially depending on the fabric you're drawing. This being a kind of heavier looking, kind of almost canvas looking fabric, you wanna draw a little less folds, uh, maybe a little more squared off folds too. Otherwise it's gonna look a little too uh, light and flimsy, kind of like the linen example that we looked at. All right, so this is the only one I'm gonna to do tone on because uh, I don't wanna overcomplicate things here, but I do just wanna show this is a way that you can go about doing your folds. Once you have an indication of where you wanna place them like I did with my line drawing, you can go ahead in and throw a tone on. Obviously the curtain is gray here, so that works really well and easily to make it a gray curtain. And so I gave myself a neutral gray tone coming in with a darker gray and just filling in my shadow shape areas, which is where again, the, the fabric creases inward 
and less light is captured, right? So it's an easy way to think about that. Where just want to think about where is light hitting, where is light not going to hit, or where is it going to hit less? And once you go ahead and draw in those indications, you want to look for your big shapes for that one. You can then pick out a lighter color. And with your lighter color, just add highlights in around where you really think that light's gonna be hitting first. So right where that fold is probably popping up, that's where you wanna think about that light coming in. So this is just some extra detail. Let's jump to another example here. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of what we really want to know here, right? What we really want to know is how do we draw this stuff on characters, on people? Because um, that's what this series is about, right? Clothed figure drawing. So over here we have a pretty nice example of just kind of a loose sweat-like material. We're going to be drawing from this section right here. To start it off nice and easy, we don't have too much fabric going on. It's not too many crazy folds all over the place. Um, but just to kind of take it in. So you can really see if the leg is a tube here and you have the bottom of that tube, which is that tight kind of elastic fabric that they put at the bottom of sweatpants. Everything right here is gathered together material, which is why we're getting this spiral fold coming in here because the fabric is kind of, the fabric wants to go a little further down, but it can't, so it's gathering together and it's giving us a little bit of a twist and a little bit of a compression and that gives us our spiral fold. So I'm going to zoom in on this picture a little bit and we'll draw it out together. All right, so here we have a pretty simple one. There's not too many folds going on and you really want to relate to that when you're drawing this as well. Uh, the more complicated you make it, the more complicated it's going to seem. And here we really just have some long sweatpants that are on someone whose legs are not long enough to fill them. So that fabric just compressed a little bit. So we just want to indicate that. Uh, remember, we're always going to draw in what we're drawing on top of when we're drawing figures with clothes on. So it's an underdrawing. Sometimes you can get away without the underdrawing if you know what you're doing. But if you're not comfortable yet with that, I definitely suggest drawing at least some indication of a cylinder underneath. The reason this helps is you really want to think about where your curves and your folds are wrapping around. You know, they don't just go straight left to right or up and down. They are all curved. They're wrapping over a cylindrical form. So it just kind of helps to have that underneath your drawing from the get go. So as you can see here, I'm just kind of drawing in my uh, silhouette bumps here just so that way I can come in and then create the creases that that I really want to show. I don't have to show every crease again. It just has to be believable. So I just need to get the general idea of what the image is showing. So that way I'm kind of understanding how to do this on my own if I, will, if I wanted to, right? So I'm kind of finding these pockets where if the pants bowed out a little bit, it creates like a little hook of shadow in there and these, uh, the fabric kind of folds into each other. But because it's a nice thick sweatpants fabric, we don't see too thin of folds. All right, so here we have some really wrinkly and or long pants. Um, not sure about the fashion choice on this one, but maybe I'm just not enough of a fashionista here. But you wanna imagine when you're thinking about the compression of fabric here. So if this guy were to hold these pants up in front of us without his leg being inside of it, these pants would go significantly lower to the ground, right? So he's really compressed these pants. These pants are much longer than his leg. So that's what's happening from that knee all the way to the top of the shoe there. We can really see this just great accordion effect going on as kind of gravity pulls down onto this fabric. You guys don't have to draw the shoe in here. Again, I'm just kind of drawing it as indication so you guys know where 
my drawing is taking place from. Essentially, if you can see that circle I drew over there, that's where I'm going to guess the knee is about. Kind of hard to tell when you have some really, really baggy pants like this. And then I'm just going to work my way down um, with that silhouetted bump formula. Another reason I do the outside first is because you do want to think about your drawings and your illustrations in form of silhouettes. If someone were to look at this drawing from far away, they might not notice the detail of the fold you're giving them. But if they can see this bumpy texture on the outside, it kind of fills it in in their brain that there's some fold going on in the clothes. So it's just kind of an indication of a way to show that <clears throat> without someone having to see every single detail. So to me, this is just as important as filling in the folds on the inside. Now, if you looked at the picture on the left, where I drew about that indication of the knee, that's technically um, a zigzag fold right there. You can see it's a really big open eye area, but right below that is where we start getting into those spiral folds. So if you are wondering, you know, the differences here, they're very slim, they're very li little, the differences here, and sometimes they can kind of coexist together, the spiral fold and the zigzag fold, but you do want to see the differences. Generally, when you have these tighter, more close together folds that are kind of compressing into each other, those are going to be your spiral folds. Now, don't get overwhelmed by this picture. Again, just like I mentioned in the last ones, you just kind of want to get the indication. So. I do want to draw a lot of lines because I do like the kind of really accordion compression that I'm getting here, but it doesn't need to be perfect and exact. I don't need to draw and show every single fold that we're seeing in the image. I just need to understand what the image is showing me, and then I can kind of come in and create a little bit of my own show with it, right? So you want to, you want to try that every now and then. Try to exaggerate things. Try to take your own direction on it. See if you can make it believable. Because um, that's, again, is going to help you translate to what's really important, which is being able to draw this um, without having to look at an image if you don't have it at the time, right? So I'm really just kind of thinking of going back and forth, competing sides. Um, some lines I want to go all the way from one side to the other, and I'm keeping them nice and round and going around my cylindrical shape, thinking about that form underneath. Moving up the body, the common material that will cause the spiral fold is going to be sweaters or anything with a long sleeve, really. Um, primarily when someone rolls their sleeve up a little bit. So you can see that with this guy here, his sleeve is kind of rolled up a little bit, which is giving us the gathering of the fabric right over here around the elbow area. And because of this, we know that it's not a zigzag fold. A zigzag fold is created naturally without the gathering of material. So, and again, you can see too that remember we were talking about the close knit aspect of the spiral fold. So a couple of things to keep in mind when we're drawing this, you can see that the folds pretty much follow the tension of what's going on here between, you know, this side of the elbow and this side. So they're really just kind of going back and forth over here. The lines are nice and thin and we want to think about that material. This looks like a really thin material sweater vest kind of thing. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then we'll look at something with a little more thicker material after, but let's give this guy his time in the light. And we're gonna draw that elbow section right there. So this is a nice simple one to start off with. The next picture is gonna be a little bit of a more complicated sweater. So I like this material because it's that athletic kind of material where it's nice and thin. So these folds are just really kind of delicate and small. And we really get to see that tension between one side of the elbow to the other side, right? Which is kind of cool. And it just, it's really just based on, you know, this guy pulled his sleeves up and of course the fabric is compressed together there and nice and tight around the arm. So when you're drawing your bump shapes, you just want to look in there and get these really nice tight compressed bumps. Um, this again is going to lead to your viewer of your picture, understanding what kind of material you're, material you are showing them without, you know, throwing it in their face saying athletic gear, right? All I'm drawing is an arm, so we really don't have that indication. So getting in a bunch of these little bumps on the side, already creating a strong silhouette. 
So, again, once you get a strong silhouette, you know, the rest of the drawing, it comes in easy. So I wanted to keep it nice and simple here. These are really just competing lines, one coming from the other, one coming from the left to right, and then some of them going all the way across. As long as you don't forget that you are going across a cylindrical form, really as many lines as you can throw in here, it'll be believable. Here we have two examples of a thicker material of sweaters. Um, on the left we have like a knit, and on the right we have kind of like a thick cotton blend. And you can see already the difference between the last picture that we just looked at, where we were looking at a thinner, more athletic kind of material, right? So the last one we had really tight, um, easily spiral looking line, more linear kind of folds. And here we have a little bit of bigger gaps, right? So what I mean by that, as you can see, we kind of have these sections that create these little pockets in here. And that's because of the thickness of the fabric kind of holding its integrity a little bit better than that thinner material that we were looking at with the athletic gear. So with this material, what we're really thinking of is if we look over at the left arm over here on our left image, we really want to think about how big these pockets of folds are, right? They're not as tight knit um, as we've seen in some previous examples. So again, we want to be thinking big folds coming in and interlocking with each other, but they're still creating that point between the tension points here the entire time. And you also want to be thinking about the fact that these folds are wrapping around to the other side. So if you were able to see it, it would still go around, right? So always draw your folds with the volume of that cylinder that is underneath. That's why we're not just drawing a rectangle, but we're thinking of these as cylindrical objects underneath the clothes. So this will be our last example for the spiral fold. So let's go ahead and choose this lady over here as our model. And of course we will use her nice big sleeve that we see here as our example for today. Okay, so biggest thing here, like I mentioned, big open bumps and areas, right? So throwing in my arm here, just kind of thinking of an indication of a bent arm you know, thinking about that cylinder shape. And then of course, you know, arms taper as they go down, right? So the elbow is gonna be a little wider than the wrist. Um, you can add that in there if you need to. But for this picture's purposes, we really don't see too much of the wrist to the hand because the sleeve is really pulled up on the arm there. So anyways, what I'm gonna do to indicate where I wanna start, cause I'm thinking more about those folds. And if I start from the top, there's so much fabric I'm gonna get lost. I'm gonna start where that stretchy part of the sweater is tight around her wrist. And you guys can see I drew a full circle there cause again, the sweater goes around her wrist completely. There's a full ellipse there and I wanna make sure I capture that ellipse um, in order to make that wraparound believable. Um, it's not part of, you know, drawing folds, but it is a very important part of drawing clothed figures. So here when I'm drawing my bump structures, I just want to think big and blocky, um, but still round because this is like a nice knit material. So it's not going to create too many hard edged angles, um, but I just needed to think about big and flowy. <clears throat> I did mess up a little bit on this left side. I left it in for you guys. I will correct it in there. Um, but I just kind of put too much fabric, I think, thinking about how big it was. But again, with this kind of fabric, and especially since it's a lighter color material too, we're not gonna get hard, hard shadows, and we're not gonna get really tight and distinct lines like we saw with the athletic gear sweater, right? So you wanna be a little looser here, maybe like an indication that a fold is going over, and then dial it back from there. You can see I could even call it right here and it would be pretty believable. But I come in and just throw in a little indication more of a few shapes here. So you really just wanna express that it's wrapping around that cylinder shape and get in exactly what you're trying to tell your audience.
All right, guys, here's a look at everything we drew today. I hope you guys took something away from this. I know this seems really similar to the zigzag fold. There are some differences, so I hope I was able to communicate that to you guys. And hopefully it didn't seem too complicated. I know sometimes this stuff can seem a little overwhelming, but when you learn to break it down and kind of cheat the system a little bit, it goes a long way. As always, guys, thank you for watching. I hope you guys try this one out. If you have any suggestions for videos in the future, please just let me know down in the comments below, and I'll do my best to make those happen. All right, guys, have a great day.